there is a lot of signs on the brain differences in ADHD and CPTSD. But let's not just talk about the signs, but about how do the two conditions show up and differ in the real world? How does someone with an ADHD brain operates compared to someone with a trauma-influenced brain? Today, we are taking a closer look at nine signs of adult ADHD in comparison to similar signs of childhood trauma. We are also discussing the neurological differences behind these two. And in the end, I will show you an updated version of the Venn diagram. Let's start. Welcome to today's episode. My name is Robert. And before we start, this video is the second one of the three part series here on this channel on ADHD and complex trauma. The first episode was all about identifying symptoms of complex trauma. And we worked with my favorite paper, Adult Survivors of Childhood Trauma. And today we'll focus on the ADHD side of signs and symptoms. And the third video, we'll talk about a combined type of both conditions and which treatments are helpful then. Yeah, the first video was based on the paper Adult Survivors of Childhood Trauma and today's video is based on this article published by Dr. Neff on the website neurodivergentinsights.com where she compares ADHD and trauma. I'm also not a therapist myself, so I just speak out of my experience from my work with therapists and from my research based on these articles and based on the studies, which are all linked in the description below. I do this theories because I believe that it's very difficult to distinguish between ADHD and complex trauma. Some clinicians say that we are misdiagnosing ADHD as trauma and others say we are overdiagnosing trauma and miss the ADHD. Very often, I found out, they occur together or trauma even triggers and activates predispositional ADHD. We'll have a look at that in the third episode here. What is ADHD? Let's start with that. ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder that affects roughly around 5%. Some sources say 7% of adults worldwide. Usually it's diagnosed in children and it also runs in families. So there is a genetic link. There is an 80% chance to get ADHD if your parents also have it. So usually it's innate. So you are born with that neurodivergence. Major characteristics of ADHD, and we'll talk about them in more detail in this episode, are for example, inattention or impulsivity, and hyperactivity, while inattention is described as the difficulty of regulating attention. When diagnosing ADHD, there are three potential classifications or forms here. There is ADHD-I, which is characterized by difficulties in regulating attention. There is ADHD-H, it's characterized by impulsive and hyperactivity. And there is ADHD-C, which is characterized by both inattention and hyperactive behavior and impulsivity. Before we dive into the neurological differences between those two, let's also talk about complex trauma. So CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, that's a prolonged or accumulated series of small unfavorable events which often happen during childhood. People who have CPTSD often have been living in an abusive household or facing chronic neglect there in an abusive or toxic family system. And studies estimate that around 13 to 30% 30 of people experience CPTSD related symptoms as adults. So there are many of us, like at least one third of the population, others say, well, it's a bit less. Typical characteristics for CPTSD are somatic symptoms and reactions such as hypervigilance, that means that you're always on high alert, chronic pain or emotional flashbacks. Unlike ADHD, which you are born with, CPTSD is shaped by the experiences you go through often when you're very young and vulnerable. 
Now, before we discuss the signs of ADHD, I want to have a look at the differences within the brain which are present in ADHD. And there are different brain networks and processes that I found out which are implicated in ADHD compared to neurotypical people or people who just have CPTSD but not ADHD. I want to compare these now. Okay, so three examples of ADHD that I found out that I like to discuss here are, for example, number one, an influence default mode network. I will explain to you what that means. Attention and cognitive controls networks and the dopamine reward system. Maybe you heard the third one already. I think it's uh, the, the most popular um, implication here in the brain of people with ADHD. So let's talk about the default mode network. The default mode network, short DMN, and I use this short form now, in the brain is normally active when we are resting, when we're thinking about ourselves or when we are remembering personal memories. The DMN therefore refers to all the brain regions that are very active during mind wandering and introspection. It is less active when a person tries to focus their attention on one specific task. This system is divergent in ADHD brains. So it works a bit different. And this DMN is therefore probably associated with a distractibility in ADHD. This brain scan here shows the regions of the default mode network. So you can see where those regions are within the brain. So what we see on brain scans of people with ADHD is that we have a lower activity in specifically those brain regions. And we see a higher brain activity in people with emitted ADHD. This is, for example, a study, which I will also link to you below this video, where you can see the comparison between the activation of the DMN in persistent ADHD versus the activation of those brain regions in remitted ADHD in orange. On the left image, you can now see there is less activation in the brain in people with persistent ADHD. And in blue, you can see that there is more activation if ADHD is remitted. The following brain scan from another study shows similar images here for PTSD brains. Now, we compare complex trauma now with control groups, so where is no trauma present. In the control brain, so in the neurotypical, let's say, healthy brains, okay, we have a higher activity, of course, in the DMN. In PTSD, on the other hand, we also see a lower activity as well, but just in the resting state and under threat, there is also a heightened activity. In simple words, in healthy people, the default mode network helps create a healthy sense of self that feels consistent over time and can be accessed consciously. In people with complex trauma, however, in the brain, the default mode network doesn't connect as well during rest, especially in those with more severe PTSD symptoms. And this, if we have a look at the brain scans now, is a huge similarity to ADHD. Because in ADHD as well, in complex trauma affected brains, we see a decreased activity in the default mode network, so in those brain regions. This reduced DMN activity in PTSD might explain why trauma feels deeply tied to the sense of self. In other words, changes in the DMN could partly explain why people with PTSD feel like their trauma has become part of who they are. And here is the brain scan, here are the studies. We see that the first row, A, is the resting state in the control group and the healthy brain, high activation of the default mode network in PTSD, low activation. While being on threat, there we have a low activation in the controls and the high activation in the PTSD brain. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, I try to make things understandable and try to visualize them. 
And based on the studies we have seen, I try to visualize or recreate how the activation in the default mode network in the brain could look like. And those are the images I came up with. On the left side, the interpretation of those studies of low DMN activity in ADHD brains, for example, and on the right side, the interpretation of high neurotypical DMN activity. That was the first major brain difference in people with ADHD. Now let's talk about the other two. There is attention and cognitive control networks as well. People with ADHD also show a lower brain activity in these brain regions. And these brain regions are linked to the default mode network. So there is a, there is a specific connection. So usually in neurotypicals, what I found out is when activity in the default mode network increases, in attention and cognitive control networks, activity decreases and vice versa. So the hypothesis for ADHD is that in the default mode network, activity is dysregulated and interferes with the activity in the other brain networks which causes malfunction of attention and cognitive control. So that's just a hypothesis to explain where the difficulties with attention and cognition in ADHD come from. Another explanation or hypothesis here is directly linked with the third implication of the brain here, the dopamine reward system, which is probably the most popular one of all those three. In that hypothesis, people with ADHD tend to have a divergence in their reward system activity. The reward system of the brain, those are structures that influence motivation, anticipation and learning. And the hypothesis for ADHD here is that the differences in the reward system might lead to a strong longing for short time rewards. So they want it right now. ADHD dealers therefore could prefer short-time pleasure over long-time planning and decision-making due to that brain difference. The reward system also includes some of the major pathways of dopamine in the brain. The dopamine system is therefore affected in ADHD. And this is why in ADHD also often medications are used that increase the transmission of dopamine. Whew, now, enough of that theory and science that put that away. And now let's talk about the nine signs in the real world of ADHD. So number one, there are struggles with focus, which are not triggered by trauma. We compare ADHD and trauma here and have a look at specific ADHD signs in the real world. Now staying focused is not just an issue for all dopamine junkies out there scrolling through TikTok and shorts all day long. No, it's definitely one of the major symptoms of adult ADHD. Inattention is a symptom that usually appears in early childhood, usually from age seven already and persists in many ADHD lists into adulthood, up to 90% here experience that symptom. For some people with ADHD, struggling with focus is part of who they are. So it kind of became their identity. It has been an issue since they can remember. It's consistent and present across different situations. For example, school when they grow up, work when they're older, or even social interactions as adults. In ADHD, this inability to focus is not linked to trauma or specific memories is also not linked to an overconsumption of social media or phone usage, which then eventually vandalizes the dopamine system. No, it's caused by an innate difference in the brain. And this neurodivergence causes attention being easily pulled away from by external stimuli, by boredom, or just by a lack of stimulation. And therefore, a person with ADHD I have trouble focusing on quiet activity like reading a book or just sitting there through a lecture, even if they feel comfortable and safely relaxed. In contrast, CPTSD related focus issues are often linked to emotional triggers or to reminders of past trauma. For someone with complex trauma, focus issues might not be as constant as for someone with ADHD. And instead, 
they may lose focus specifically when they're reminded of something painful or when they feel emotionally unsafe, when they're triggered, dissociate. And CPTSD, this lack of focus, can also be a result of something we call hypervigilance. Hypervigilance, as I said already before, is the state where you feel constantly alert and scan the environment for potential threats here. Sign number two, physical hyperactivity and restlessness. Both conditions, ADHD as well as complex trauma, involve physical symptoms, but they look very different in each of those conditions. One of the classic signs of ADHD is the need for physical movement. Others refer that also as hyperactivity. And this is what we often have in mind if we think of a hyperactive boy who can't sit still. And I picture that boy, for example, in that episode here about ADHD, just right in the intro. And this hyperactivity can include behaviors like fidgeting, foot tapping, pacing, or an inability just sit still for long periods. This need for movement isn't about feeling anxious or unsafe, like your body could react as a result of complex trauma. No, it's simply the ADHD's brain to seek stimulation. Physical hyperactivity is an attempt to keep the mind engaged. And again, remember the hypothesis about the reward and dopamine system. This can also be a part of it. Another hypothesis is that restlessness and movement our way to re-regulate the nervous system. I explained that, for example, in our free workbook, Re-Regulation Resources. I also explained uh, the link between neurodivergent conditions such as ADHD and autism and as well complex trauma with the nervous system and how those are linked, how the nervous system is really sensitive in those conditions. In this video, where I compare those, I will link to you that video as well in the description below. By the way, if you're currently dealing with restlessness or chronic nervousness, I definitely recommend to you downloading our free workbook because it's full of those re-regulation tools and resources, including writing techniques that I learned from my therapist. Just go to understandable.net slash book and grab your copy now. In CPTSD, on the other hand, compared to ADHD, we usually don't see that physical hyperactivity. Instead, it tends to lead again to hypervigilance as described in sign one. And hypervigilance can cause chronic tension and make it hard to relax, but it's different from restlessness seen in ADHD. But again, it is definitely linked to the same cause, which is a dysregulated nervous system. So re-regulation of the nervous system definitely plays a huge role in here. Sign number three, impulsivity, but not driven by trauma response. Impulsivity is another hallmark symptom of ADHD, but it can sometimes appear in people with CPTSD as well. The key difference here in ADHD, impulsivity is more about spontaneous decision making and acting without thinking it through. In CPTSD, impulsivity often comes as a reaction to emotional triggers or overwhelming stress. For people with ADHD, impulsivity often appears as spontaneous in the moment decisions that aren't tied to any specific emotional triggers. This impulsivity is typically due to the brain's lower levels of dopamine, which can lead to a constant search for novelty and stimulation. Maybe you know that if you have ADHD. So someone with ADHD might act on a whim simply because something seems exciting or interesting in that moment. And another reason for that behavior is the struggle with delayed gratification again. Remember, they prefer immediate rewards, which can make it hard to resist impulses. In CPTSD, on the other hand, impulsive behaviors are usually triggered by emotional distress or feelings tied to past trauma. I have that, for example, when I am dysregulated, I tend to react very defiantly and not very well thought, to be honest. Some other people I know tend to eat, for example, out of impulsion. And this is a way to cope with overwhelming feelings or to distract themselves from pain. This behavior in CPTSD is also a way to self soothe to re-regulate a dysregulated nervous system again. Sign number four, forgetfulness, 
not linked to avoidance. Forgetfulness in ADHD is linked to the struggle with working memory. Working memory is the part of your memory that helps you keep track of things in a short term. This can lead to things, and maybe you know some of these things yourself, like misplacing items here and there, forgetting appointments, or not remembering details just from recent conversations. So everything you talk about with people is just going through like this. This is a good example for that. This forgetfulness can be very annoying for your partner, for your friends, or for others. But it's very important to mention here that it's not intentional. So they don't do that because they want to provoke you or something. It's just part of the ADHD's brain and it's pretty natural for them. It's a difficulty with holding on to information. This type of forgetfulness is persistent and is appearing across various areas of life, whether it's work, social interactions or daily tasks. So it's present everywhere for people who have ADHD least for some of them. Another key aspect of ADHD-related forgetfulness is that it's often caused by inattention and distractibility. So when something doesn't hold their focus, they are more likely to forget it and easily distract themselves. Oh, a flower! In CPTSD, forgetfulness can sometimes appear as a form of avoidance. This isn't typical forgetfulness then, but it's a subconscious way of protecting oneself, for example, from painful memories and emotions. From the outside, it quite often looks that this person might be inattentive or might be callous, might be not listening, but it's just them being dysregulated and being avoidant to protect themselves. Another big symptom which contributes to that as well and often adds up is dissociation. In a trigger or flashback situation, and that can happen at any time for someone with a dysregulated CPTSD brain, body and mind separate for them. So they become really inattentive. I also have that quite often, to be honest. And I already made a full episode about dissociation, which I will link to you up here and in the description below. It's a really interesting concept and it's worth understanding it. Sign number five, a difficulty with time management. People with ADHD frequently experience something called time blindness. Simply spoken, that means that they struggle to estimate how long tasks will take, which can lead to poor time management, missed deadlines or chronic lateness. Do you have that? And this phenomenon is not about stress or anxiety. It's a fundamental issue with how the ADHD brain processes and perceives time. It's consistent across various areas of life again, affecting work, social commitments, and other daily routines. And that can be very frustrating for people with ADHD. Another component here related to time management is the inconsistent sense of urgency. Tasks that are not immediately engaging or stimulating can feel out of time for people with ADHD, which means people with ADHD may not feel the sense of urgency until the last minute. And this quite often then results in procrastination. And procrastination is also a very common symptom of childhood trauma why those are pretty difficult to distinguish from one another. In CPTSD, procrastination is caused by the need to avoid or to push away painful emotions. When your mom, for example, always said, wanting a lot of money is bad, wealthy people are always bad people, then you might have internalized those beliefs and then, as a result, as an adult, you might hesitate or procrastinate looking for a well-paid job or try to make as less money as possible and block yourself with those beliefs. Therefore, some people with CPTSD also do things last minute or avoid them completely. Sign number six, interest-based motivation. This one is really interesting. What we can conclude so far is that people with ADHD tend to have a hard time engaging with tasks that don't provide immediate interest or rewards. Again, divergent dopamine system. This also means that they're highly motivated by activities that feel exciting or rewarding right away. 
They're not avoiding discomfort that way. Their brains just try to prioritize tasks based on immediate interest and reward. Again, tasks that are repetitive, dull or lack of immediate payoff can lead to procrastination. I was looking for a good example for that sign, so I asked ChatGPT and he gave me this one. Imagine someone with ADHD who needs to do their taxes. Filing taxes can be tangious and lacks any immediate reward. They're not avoiding it due to emotional pain. It's simply because the task doesn't capture their interest. Honestly, what I thought is doing taxes never really offers long time rewards and doing them also creates a lot of emotional pain. Such a bad example. Let's look at the CPTSD side here, because here we can experience such things as avoidance again. But avoidance isn't about interest levels. It's again a response to emotional discomfort or pain. Specific tasks or specific situations that remind them of past trauma can trigger avoidance behaviors even if they know that the task is necessary or important. A good example here is, for example, if you can say no to someone, like uh, someone who invited you to a party, but you don't want to go there, so you need to cancel it. But what you feel there is you feel guilt and you feel ashamed for saying no. So you avoid that. This avoidance is often a subconscious way of protecting ourselves from emotional pain. It can affect our willingness to engage in certain activities, conversations or relationships. This is why we just don't do it sometimes. So what happens if you don't say no and you go to that party, you go to that meeting you don't want to go to, then often you will feel at the mercy of others. You feel like that you constantly have to hold it, that you have to go through it but you actually don't have to do it. You could say no, but you don't know that saying no is an option. Sign number seven, emotional reactivity related to stimuli, not to flashbacks. Emotional dysregulation is a symptom which is present in both in ADHD and CPTSD. Though people with ADHD often experience emotional reactivity, where they react strongly to frustrations, to annoyance or to excitement. And this reactivity isn't rooted in past trauma here. Instead, it's more about being sensitive to what's happening in the present moment. Again, decreased dopamine, that's the reason for that. And this results in often exaggerated or emotional responses. What's also typical here is that if someone with ADHD gets frustrated easily, the frustration usually passes as quickly as it came. Meaning, these emotional responses are often very short-lived and don't linger after the triggering event has been ended. And that's way different in CPTSD. Their emotional reactivity often comes from flashbacks and these are intense emotional experiences where the person feels as though they are reliving a traumatic event even if they aren't fully aware of the specific memory of that event. Flashbacks can be triggered by something in the present that subconsciously reminds the person of past trauma. During these moments, the emotional response is often very deep, very overwhelming, and I know that fills up the complete body. It somehow feels that you are reliving and re-experiencing that traumatic situation, but you can't really remember what exactly happened there. The major difference between those two experiences in ADHD people and people with CPTSD is in ADHD we see a very very quick reactivity. Emotional responses on the other hand in people with CPTSD can definitely linger. After a flashback a person might feel drained, might feel anxious or distressed for hours or even days. And if you have complex trauma, you know what I'm talking about. It's really heavy shit here. It's like an emotional hangover that happens after an emotional flashback or traumatic re-experiencing. Sign number eight, zoning out due to boredom, not due to dissociation. Terms worth to mention here are things such as daydreaming and wandering thoughts. 
Sounds relatable? That's ADHD. Those things happen when people with ADHD try to maintain focus on tasks that aren't stimulating. When something feels boring, feels repetitive, their mind can drift off into daydreams and random thoughts. And ADHD zoning out is usually harmless and doesn't involve feelings of fear, anxiety or discomfort, like for example in people with complex trauma. It's just a natural part of how the ADHD brain works and it's more about boredom and the need for constant stimulation than like for self-protection, for example. And that's different in CPTSD because people with CPTSD, we're dropping dissociation here again, they are experiencing overwhelming experiences. And those overwhelming experiences, it can be overwhelming boredom as well, of course. But then dissociation comes into play, which is a protective mechanism for overwhelm. And the mind tries to distance itself again from that emotional distress. We discussed dissociation already in sign number four here. And now let's talk about the last sign, which is sign number one, hyperfocus. Now, this last trait on the list is unique for ADHD. Hyperfocus does not appear in people with CPTSD, but some people with autism or Asperger's have that as well. So what is hyperfocus? Hyperfocus is when the person with ADHD becomes so deeply absorbed in an activity they find stimulating or interesting, that they can lose track of time and overlook everything else around them. This could mean working on a project for hours without noticing the time passing or focusing intensely on a hobby while forgetting other responsibilities. There existing negative as well as positive states of hyperfocus and that means it can be productive but also problematic as it can lead to neglecting other important tasks or obligations. The positive version of the hyperfocus is experienced as something similar as the flow state where you're focused totally in one specific task. What's also typical for the hyperfocus is that the person, if they're experiencing such a state, the person cannot decide proactively to enter that state. So it's just happening to them. For individuals with complex trauma, focus isn't usually driven by intense personal interest in the same way. Instead, attention may be scattered due to hypervigilance or affected by emotional triggers. In CPTSD, the attention issues are often related to avoiding distress, as we discussed, rather than being absorbed in something enjoyable. And after hearing all of these ADHD symptoms now, do you believe that you are on the ADHD spectrum or maybe you already knew before? Now, what we do now is we're having a look at the updated version of the Venn diagram here. On the left side, as we discussed in the previous episode, we have all the CPTSD related symptoms, which are attachment problems, things as hypervigilance, emotional flashbacks, low self-esteem, toxic shame and guilt, avoidance and isolation, and physical symptoms. Now on the right side, we have the ADHD related symptoms that we just talked about in this episode, which are hyperactivity, impulsivity, self-criticism around ADHD behaviors, such as you can't sit still, you can't stay focused, so specific self-esteem issues, inattention and forgetfulness, as well as boredom, hyperfocus in a positive and negative way, distraction and interest-based motivation, and task complementation and time management problems. In the middle, in the overlap, we see those signs which are typical for both conditions and where we often see difficulties to distinguish between those two, especially when getting a diagnosis. So there is dissociation as one big symptom that we talked through, but also emotional dysregulation and high sensitivity. High sensitivity and especially the nervous system, which is super sensitive, usually in people who have CPTSD and as well in ADHD. So there is a huge correlation. That's one of the major causes for the differences and for the reactions we observe in people who have those conditions. Also, a tendency for substance abuse comes with both conditions because medications are usually things that people use to cope with the symptoms. 
Now let's summarize what we talked about today. ADHD and CPTSD differ in their symptoms and their differences in the brain. Still, most symptoms can be traced back to a really sensitive nervous system and therefore being gentle and compassionate with ourselves can be truly helpful. In the next episode, the third part of this series, we talk about a combined diagnosis of both conditions, so where both are present, and potential treatments. But for now, if you are currently looking for a supportive environment as someone who has ADHD or has CPTSD, we also offer an online community platform for people like us. The community is a safe place for people with CPTSD, for neurodivergent or really sensitive people. And there on this platform, we offer support and guiding online courses that show you a step-by-step -step path on how to resolve the symptoms of complex trauma and also on how to learn to re-regulate your nervous system. If you want to check out the full platform and all the online courses, just go to understandable.net slash join, have a look at the website and become a member today. Maybe we see each other then in the exclusive community. Now, what do you think about the whole topic about ADHD and CPTSD? Do you believe and have you seen that, that it's really difficult to distinguish them or is it pretty clear for you? Definitely leave me a comment below. And if you want to support the podcast, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And I see and speak to you next Sunday for another episode here on this channel. Have a great day.